Uh, it's a break. Why would you give me a mental exercise through during a break? Yes. So put your hand up if between you and your peers you worked out why the formula in the top right hand corner is not suitable to use for this problem. Did everyone feel that they got there? 10% of the class. Just by virtue of some people never put their hand up, put your hand up if you feel like the formula in the top right hand corner would be appropriate to use or you're not sure why it's not. So you would have used it, cool. More than people who didn't, so that's fine. Um, yes, you're right. So I'll unfreeze that. I just, and here's the, here's the problem with providing a formula sheet. Um, the problem with providing a formula sheet is you don't know the context in which the formulas are appropriate. And if I wrote in what context each formula was appropriate, well, then it would be like writing a textbook. And I'd pro I'd, my, here's the problem. My temptation would be I'd truncate the comments down to only those that were appropriate for you to know in the exam. And then it's like I would give you a work solution at the back and you just have to write it at the front. But <laughs> do that. Everyone will do well in the exam if we do that. Cool. <coughs> so here's, here's the problem with this formula, right? So this formula is only, um, is only appropriate to use in the case that you're dealing with an ideal gas, <coughs> okay? And the reason this formula works for an isothermal process is that an ideal gas, if we look on a PV, if we look on a PV chart, and what am I doing expanding? So I'm going from some, good, some pressure and volume to another pressure and volume, and then I'm taking the area under this graph. Boop, 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 boop. And we say the integrals, because work from one to two, is the integral from one to two of P dV. Yeah, it feels about right. <coughs> and we find that because this is isothermal and it's an ideal gas, so we find that PV is a constant, right? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to remember the derivation. Um, but that's okay. We find that pressure is proportional to 1 on V, and so you get some sort of constant, and then you get a 1 on V dV, and then you get the constant log V between one and two, and so you end up getting a constant log V2 minus log V1, which log rules mean that becomes a ratio, so it's log V2 on V1, and lo and behold, that constant, which I didn't define earlier, ends up being P1 V1 log V2 on V1, and yeah, P times V equals constant. That looks right. Constant subs in as PV1, yes. Um, so that's where that formula comes from. And because that formula comes from there, it's only appropriate in isothermal cases where the isothermal case creates this. Okay, so this is from our combined gas law that PV divided by T is a constant. If you keep the temperature constant, then PV is equal to a constant because you can remove the thing that doesn't change and then the constant is different. But um, right. So in this case, for an ideal gas, being isothermal creates that relationship. And when you plug that relationship into this integral, you get, I'm glad I don't teach math, um, you get the formula down the bottom. The problem with if we come back to our cylinder, the problem with this case, um, and the reason why everyone who did supplementary um, got this question wrong, <coughs> was that although this is isothermal, as we boil this liquid off at 100 degrees C, so we're adding heat in order to boil this liquid off, it's also isobaric. So rather than the pressure dropping as the volume changes, this actually, so this second process, let me draw it in a different colour, will start at some pressure, one atmosphere and some 
specific volume, and then the substance will boil, and indeed the pressure will stay the same as it boils until it gets to that state point where all of the um, liquids boil off. And the area under that is that there, and so what I had, look when I write the question, I, I think a certain way, um, and I, you know, what I had thought was that we knew the pressure, 101.325, this wasn't the actual figure, but they'd, they'd be given volume one, that was given, they'd calculate volume two by reading the tables, and then work would just be pressure V2 minus V1. In this case, but that's not true for every pure substance isothermal process, right? So you have to be aware of what the process does, not just substituting the formulas. And that's the problem in the, uh, when I looked in the back of the thing, the formula was there, it said isothermal and everything. Um, <clears throat> but it just wasn't applicable in that case. Is that good? Sorry, Han, I'll just, sorry. Before I go on, <coughs> does that clear things up for you? Those who were thought, oh no, I think that formula would still work, or I'm not sure why it doesn't. Does that clear it up? Do you want to ask any questions or talk about it? Because in a sense it's good when, you know, when, when a lot of people get something wrong, I think that's a great point for me to clarify, because it's probably something I didn't teach well. When some people get something right and some people get it wrong, that's on you. Um, when everyone gets it wrong, I think that's a bit of a reflection on maybe something I haven't covered. Cool. Good. So we can modify our Brayton cycle to improve the thermal efficiency of power that we get out of the turbines. <coughs> what about if we don't want power out of the turbine as a goal? And so an example of that, and this is, um, I think the only thing, the only cycle we'll do in the power, um, in the heat engine system, where a jet propulsion cycle doesn't actually want electrical power out of the turbine, it wants a thing called thrust. And so the whole way we look at the, the cycle is a little bit different. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, there's six state points in this cycle. Right, you can see, so this is a jet engine, so this is uh, used on like a fighter craft, <coughs> for example. So making um, planes go fast. So we're drawing in air at state point one. It's not exactly ambient. Two things, one, your, your elevation generally, and two, you're generally traveling fast. So we've got some relative velocity that we can do something with. You're taking it through a diffuser to get to state point two. Um, that's fine. Uh, taking it through a compressor, state point two to three, then we combust it. So from state point two to state point five looks like what we're used to, and then we've got a nozzle at the end. So we've got a diffuser at the front, nozzle at the end, and we're not looking for electrical work as our output. <coughs> so what does that look like? Um, we take our, we can get a slight pressure advantage. Okay, we can use the velocity of air coming in to the cycle at state point one. We slow that air down to state point two, and that does some of the work of compression for us. So this state point one to state point two, some of that pressure temperature increase comes from the diffuser. And then when we get to the back end of our turbine, we don't take all of the energy out, so we end up with a hot and high pressure gas at the end of our turbine. And if we force that through a nozzle, we can make it go very fast. Okay, so a nozzle is designed to turn enthalpy into um, kinetic energy. And so we get it going fast, and so that's state point five to state point six. And we'll find that the faster we can push it out the back, the more thrust we get on the aircraft. <coughs> so thrust is about changing momentum. This is a, you'll do this in fluids more than what we'll do it here, but I just want to acknowledge things like if you run water through a pipe and the pipe has a 90 degree bend in it, dreadfully drawn, sorry, that's meant to be an arrow, so the water's running through the pipe, you'll find that in order to change the direction of the water, you need to apply a force, in this case, the 45 degrees. Um, 
Fluid mechanics does a fair bit of that sort of thing. Let's just think in a straight line, okay? You've got the, yeah, I don't know. I like, I don't know. When I was doing, I'm trying to think back to when I was struggling through this, right? Because I I'm not, I'm not, don't like fluids very much, ironically, for being a thermodynamics guy. Um, so what I used to think about was like catching a discrete particle. So you take all of the mass that you would see in a second, and it's like, okay, I'm gonna catch that at 200 um, meters a second, right? I'm gonna catch that, and then I'm gonna throw it that way at 1,000 meters a second. And when I catch it, it's gonna push me this way a little bit, but when I throw it that way, it's gonna push me this way more. So I'm gonna get more thrust. And I, I think about things in, in terms of what's happening in this second as being a little discrete particle of mass. Because um, for some reason, continuum bodies um, don't sit well with me. But, sorry? It's fine. Right here. So, but the force that you get as a result of doing this process of taking air at a low velocity and spitting it out at a higher velocity is the change in momentum. So it's mass times the velocity, whatever velocity you can achieve at the exit, minus, because that velocity must be um, working against, against you, that same mass times the velocity of the inlet. Assume the mass flows the same at the inlet and outlet, and so the thrust force that you get is just the mass flow rate times the difference in velocities. So the more difference in velocities you can get, the more thrust you get, and obviously it's proportional to mass flow rate, so double the mass flow rate, you get double the thrust. For us, we want to think steady state, steady flow, nothing's changing with respect to time, and so we consider a condition where the thrust, so that which is forcing the aircraft forward, is equal to the drag, that which is dragging the craft back, and lift is equal to weight. <coughs> so we assume steady state, steady flow. And that will be the output of our calculation. So under those sorts of conditions, what power do we consider? So we're not getting electrical power out of our turbine in terms of thermal efficiency. So what power can we consider? We can consider the propulsive power. And if you push some mass with some force, okay, push a mass along with a force at some velocity, then, so all of the Vs here are velocities, none of them are volumes. I'll strike through the Vs when they're to do with volumes. So then you can talk about the power that you put into that body as being the force that you apply times the velocity the body's going. So work would be force times distance, power is force times speed, because speed is distance over time. So we find propulsive power to be our propulsive force times by the velocity of the aircraft. And when we consider efficiency, we don't consider um, electrical output from the turbine, we consider propulsive power as our thing that we want. So efficiency is thing that you want divided by what you have to put into it. So we consider propulsive power <coughs> over energy input rate. Where does the rest of the energy go? So if you, if you draw in some air and you push it out and so you've got that change in momentum, um, what else would you expect, where else would you expect the energy to go? So Q in is your heat in at the combustion chamber. Some of it comes out as propulsive power. One of them you should get based on our work so far. The other one's a bit more obscure. Would something be used to drive the turbine? Yes it is, but the work that's used to drive the turbine, you get back into the system in the compressor. So that's not lost work. That's a good question though. Oh, it's, a good, it's a good thought. But yes, you do need that. Right. So the, the gas is there, yeah go. Noise and vibration account for some of it, but very little, in terms of percentage of the, of the hole. Right. The biggest loss that you have is that the gas coming in is cold and the gas going out is hot. So the biggest loss that you have is um, you heat gas up that you then vent into the atmosphere. So it's thermal loss. Um, we will, I'll run through a calculation. Yeah, we'll be able to just run through. That's fine. And I'll show that. Another, a way of getting power quickly 
thrust quickly is after burning. And do I have a picture of a turbine? So with an afterburner, what you do is you take fuel, and again, so Brayton and Jet, so it's a, it's a very lean cycle, so there's generally oxygen left to burn. If you inject fuel in here and run it through some igniters, then you add additional heat after the turbine, and that increases the velocity coming out the back end. Um, but it's an it's a even less efficient way of generating thrust. But you can generate large amounts of thrust for short periods of time, and you would have seen that afterburners are a thing. We're talking, for, so for the jets, for pure jets, you're talking about craft that you might intend to go supersonically. We're not talking about um, passenger aircraft, we're talking about um, fighters and so forth. Yes, watch Top Gun. There's afterburners on that. Um, <coughs> after turbine, before the exhaust. Yes, so that gives you an extra bit of thrust. Cool. So let's see what that looks like. And this is also a work example of a cycle. So I thought I'd, I'd throw it in. I didn't think I had the hand, time to hand calc it. Um, but it's a work example of a six state point problem. And this is just. Um, the central and bowls example is imperial units are transferred to metric because let's just keep it simple. So a turbojet aircraft flies with a velocity, so we've got some initial velocity, at an altitude where the air is some pressure and temperature. The compressor has a pressure ratio of, in this case, 10, and we've defined the, what the turbine can handle as a turbine inlet temperature. So we can't get the turbine any hotter than 1100 degrees C. The air is coming in at 45 kilograms a second. That would be some function of how big the diffuser inlet is and the velocity of the aircraft and the density of the air. And it says, utilizing cold air assumptions determine the temperature and pressure of the gas at the turbine exit. Well, I think we should determine the temperature and pressure of the gases everywhere. Um, the velocity of gas out the exit and then therefore the propulsive efficiency of the cycle. So these are some questions that could be answered um, doing this sort of thing. If an aircraft is sitting on the runway with its brakes applied, what's the propulsive power that you get from the engines? If the aircraft is stationary, what's the propulsive power generated by the engines? Zero. Propulsive power is multiplied by the velocity of the aircraft. If the velocity of the aircraft is zero, you get no propulsive power. So you have to design for some sort of cruising. You get force. So you still get a force term, and the force is giving you the potential to, to move. Um, but like if you push really hard on a solid wall, you're not doing work unless the wall moves. You're not getting power unless the aircraft moves. So we're going to take that into consideration. <coughs> Some assumptions we would make, and this is just, just a work example, so assumptions that we make, um, steady state operating conditions, so um, nothing is going to change, the engine's not warming up or cooling down. We're using cold air assumptions, so we've got a constant CP value and a constant K value. One before they change slightly at elevated temperatures. We're going to neglect kinetic and potential energy, potential energy because it's horizontally aligned, and kinetic energy throughout the device, although we will consider it for the diffuser and the nozzle, because we must, um, otherwise we'd find no thrust. And we're going to say that the turbine work is the same as the compressor work. Typically a turbine will produce just a little bit more energy than the compressor needs, because then it will run your auxiliary services. So you run your hydraulics, your electrics, and so forth, will be powered off the turbine as well. But we're going to say ideal, um, what's the thrust? that this can generate in the absolute ideal case. So the first thing I do when I'm solving this, yeah, go. Sorry, nozzle and diffuser, my apologies. Except at the diffuser inlet and the nozzle exit. Yes, sorry, I had it written down. I was being lazy with my words. Thank you for the pickup. So the way that I solve these problems is I draw a table. 
Interestingly enough, Senjal didn't draw a table in his book when he went through the worked example. I think it's an easy way to lay the, the things out and I know what I've got yet to calculate. So we've got uh, state point one, we had a pressure, we had a temperature in degrees C that I've it was minus 40, I've converted to Kelvin, and a velocity. So we're going to assume that the engine is stationary, because we can do this, Newton's law lets us choose a frame of reference. We're going to assume the engine is stationary and the air is coming towards us at 260 meters a second. <coughs> so we assume that the air has velocity. I think we can very quickly get to temperature of state two and the velocity of the rest. Right? The velocity of the, um, throughout the system with respect to the system itself is zero um, because we're going to neglect any kinetic energies in the system. And we know that through a diffuser, our change in enthalpy is equal to our change in kinetic energies. That's how we do a diffuser. We've got our change in kinetic energies is 260 squared minus zero squared. <coughs> and our change in enthalpy of an ideal gas is Cp delta T. And so T2 equals, this is T1 plus, in this case, we've got no kinetic energy out, so we can disregard that term. So it's just 260 plus 2000 divided by so divided by 2,000 times 1.005. So this 2 becomes a 2,000. Why? Are you satisfied with why that 2 becomes a 2,000? Good. Excellent. Because we're dealing with kilojoules in one system and kilojoules in another. Right, and so we can calculate our temperature of state point 2. Now we've got a temperature of state point 2. We can calculate our pressure of state point 2 using this relationship. So this relationship is derived from PV to the power of K is constant. And PV on T is constant. Different constants. Um, so you can get to that relationship. And so you do that. And so we've raised the pressure without having to do any work, which is really nice. So a diffuser lets us raise the, the pressure a little bit. Um, this is an isentropic diffuser, so it's an ideal diffuser. <coughs> um, that gives us our pressure out. And now based on that, we know the compressor had a compression ratio of 10 to 1 from the problem. Oh. I was going to freeze one of the screens. Let me do that. Just so you've got that there. Got it? <coughs> just so you've got the, the question up. So now the, the compression ratio was 10 to 1, and so whatever your pressure in state point 2 was, you know what the state point then is 3, and no pressure lost through a combustion chamber. So that gives you the pressure for 3 and 4. And the compressor is also isentropic, and so we can know the temperature of state point 3 as well. So we can calculate those things, just multiplying by 10 for the pressure, and for the temperature, again, deriving that relationship or knowing that relationship for temperature rise through an isentropic process. And now, we can run the gas back down through a turbine. Now for a Brayton cycle, what we did with the turbine was, we took the pressure from whatever pressure it was in the combustion chamber back to ambient conditions, back to whatever it was at the inlet. This time, we're gonna do something different with running through our turbine. And what we wanna say is, how much power do I need in the compressor? So how much power do I need to get from state point two to state point three? Let my turbine give me that much power and that will then give me state point five. So knowing the conditions of state point four, knowing how much power I have to extract, that will give me state point five. So the work of the turbine plus the work of the compressor must equal zero. All the turbine um, work is being consumed by the compressor. That's just the difference in enthalpy values. That's fine. If we use constant specific heats, that's the difference in temperature values. And we find that T5 must equal, when that relationship's taken into account, 1125 Kelvin. So this is going through the process. This is an ideal gas cycle. And we can find pressure five then using an isentropic 
turbine with a drop in temperature, we can know what the drop in pressures is to get there. Someone was talking to me during the break about running an ideal gas through a throttle. And I just want to mention this here as well. Right? So for, with a throttle, sorry, so this isn't jets, my apologies, it's a little, it's a little aside. With a throttle you take, let's just put a little, come on. So you take a substance and maybe it's a liquid here, it certainly is in our, um, in our air conditioner. Right, so it's liquid here, it's flowing this way, and you're gonna take it through a throttle and it's gonna have a pressure drop. And because of the pressure drop, some of the fluid is going to evaporate and you're gonna have a sharp drop in temperature. That's what we saw in our vapor compression refrigeration cycle. If this is an ideal gas, and you run a gas through a, through a throttle, because H in, in equals H out, and because delta H equals CP delta T, what's the change in temperature of an ideal gas when it goes through a throttle? Zero. Zero. Okay, so because there's no change in enthalpy through a throttle, an ideal gas will experience no change in temperature. But this formula pre-presumes ideal gases, right? because pure substances don't have a CP value, okay? And they, they could be considered to be changing state. You, you set it up so that it changes state through the throttle, and that changing of state, <coughs> I shall leave there, that changing of state is what drives the temperature to be reduced. So just be aware, of, are you talking about pure substances? Are you talking about ideal gases? What's the relationships? This is stuff that you can work out. It is stuff you can know. Um, but you just need to be on, on the ball. Cool, sorry. Uh, so yes, back to our jet example. So we've taken some temperature out, we've taken some enthalpy out to run the compressor, and that's dropped our pressure as well. All right, and now state point six is highlighted. I'll bring state point six on. I've dropped the units column <coughs> in the table. Um, now state point six, we know what the pressure will be, so we're reventing this back out through a nozzle, back to um, at atmospheric pressure. And what's the temperature? Well, the nozzle's isentropic as well, and so we're gonna have a, a temperature drop, and the, the hot gas coming out is at 621 meters per second, 622 meters per second. Now then the question is, and this is the, the money question, what's then the velocity of that gas? And again, we can use change in enthalpy equals change in kinetic energy through an ideal nozzle. <coughs> Here's what that looks like. Cp, change in temperatures, equals um, minus just velocity two, in, or velocity six in this case, velocity five was zero. Uh, you can tra track the velocity through the engine, um, I don't know whether it would affect the calculations, because you might, well, whatever you lose at the front end, you'll probably gain at the back end, so it's probably not significant. And so we find that we've got a velocity of our exit stream of 1,000 meters a second. And that's the whole thing that this unit does. So we're burning fuel and accelerating our fluid. There's no electrical output, there's no, um, secondary outputs. So now back to the question, the question at hand, um, find the temperature and pressure of gases <coughs> at the turbine outlet. This question's been just resolved by virtue of filling out the table, um, and so we can see what that temperature and pressure is. Find the velocity of the gases at the nozzle exit, done by virtue of filling out the table. You may not have tracked the velocity um, on the table, whether you did or not and the propulsive efficiency of the cycle. And so we know that the work is going to be the force times the velocity of the aircraft, which we're given. The force is going to be the mass flow rate times the difference in exit and entry velocities. And so we get a work term up the top and a Q term down the bottom. That's the propulsive 
power of the craft. And this is the, well, that's specific propulsive power, one should say, and that's the specific heat required in. Our mass in this case cancelled out one by the other. I just wanted to put a note down the bottom. So this is a 38 megawatt unit, which seems like a lot. That's a lot of power, but <coughs> um, I guess you need to have a sense for it. Thermal efficiency, or propulsive efficiency, 22.5%. So not a very efficient way of moving the aircraft. Where does the, <coughs> where is the extra power? So energy can neither be created nor destroyed, so the power had to go somewhere. Two main places. One is kinetic energy. So when you accelerated all that gas and made it very, very fast, then it still has kinetic energy with respect to the ground state, and that kinetic energy will just be dissipated as turbulence behind the aircraft. So that's not giving you thrust, it's just being dissipated and you lost 32% there. And the gas coming out was also hot. So hotter than the gas coming in. And so you find 45% of your, um, your burning of your combustion just went out the back end as hot air. And 45 plus 32 plus 22 um, adds up to be 100%. Which leads then the question, so Oh, I did look at the history. These were, was it 52 or something? In 52, the jet propulsion cycle was invented, and then in 55, they started doing something differently. And the, the difference is bound up in <coughs> the fact that momentum is about the difference in these velocities, okay? And Kinetic energy is about, the kinetic energy lost is about the square of this velocity. So basically, if you can slow the air coming out, slow the air coming out the back end of the, of the craft, back down close to the velocity that you want to go, then you lose less energy in wasted kinetic energy. Okay? And so the thought is, well, maybe we can have a second mass stream and we can put some of our kinetic energy into that mass, pushing that along, and we can get more momentum and less wasted kinetic energy. <coughs> and that's what, so this is what you see on commercial aircraft. So you don't see a turbo jet propulsion, oh, you don't see a, just a jet propulsion, um, but you do see like a turbofan, turboprop arrangement. So in this case, what you have is you've got in here, you've got a turbojet, just following the sectional line. Up. Following the sectional line across. So that's what we've just analysed. But now, rather than have just enough output from your turbine to run your compressor, what you've got is you've got two turbines. <coughs> One of your turbines, so this inner turbine, runs on an outer shaft and runs, well in this case you've got a low pressure, oh no, yep, and runs this high pressure compressor. So you've got one turbine running one compressor and then you've got another turbine which runs down into the inner shaft which runs through the middle and it runs this low pressure compressor here and the fan through a gearing mechanism as well, not shown. Um, and so the idea here is that you've got an inner, so inner cycle which is producing you know, hot compressed gas at the end of it, then you run it through another turbine and then this low pressure compression goes around the outside and this is about moving more mass, more mass at a lower velocity and you get less wasted kinetic energy out the back. Um, you can't achieve the high top speeds that you want. Um, so that's why like fighter aircraft aren't using it, um, because you can't achieve high top speeds. 
but in terms of cruising efficiency, um, that's as good as we know how to do. And we then have bypass ratio. So then we say, well, for each kilogram of air through the core, how much air are we moving using the fan system? And so they're in the five to six range. Higher bypass ratios are more efficient, but lower top speed. <coughs> so you have to pick, um, you have to pick something. There's also um, some limitations on physical size in terms of if you undersling an engine under a wing, you need to make the landing gear longer to accommodate the, um, the engines. And one of the air aerospace uh, lecturers was telling me they're making these with, with flattened off bits so they can have the aircraft lower to the ground. But that's beyond the scope of the subject, but just interesting, um, I think. Excellent. We're not going to analyze one of those. But you certainly can. Cool, that's jet propulsion cycle. Questions about jets? Does the cycle make sense? So we hadn't considered nozzles or diffusers in a cycle until now, so it's worth doing one, I think. Um, good. Very, so this is just like a mention. Um, you can do, so what we find is, well this is a particular example, but we found the temperature at the outlet here is 621 Kelvin, so it's over 300 degrees C. And Brayton cycles generally have a high temperature outlet. And so you might be thinking, I could boil water with that. I could do something in terms of a steam cycle with the outlet of my Brayton cycle. And indeed that can be done, it's called a combined cycle, and it has been done. <coughs> and so this is a Brayton cycle sitting on top of a Rankine cycle where before you exhaust your gas out the back of your Brayton cycle, you take any extra thermal energy. You don't have any pressure there, so you can't run it through a turbine, but you've still got heat. And so what can you do with it? <coughs> you can regenerate or you can run a totally different cycle. And so this has then your four stages. So this is both simple cycles. Um, so that's our justification for it. And this is kind of what it looks like. So it ends up being a, are there nine state points here. <coughs> and basically your, your gas cycle is running up the top in blue and then your steam cycle is running down the bottom. Yeah. It's not, so in the exam, the problem won't be a four state point system. So it'll be a something else system. Um, sorry, the question was, will we need to reproduce this in exam? Um, but it's not undoable. You, you know how to do a Brayton cycle. If you don't, the PSS on the Brayton cycle is this week. And then you take the temperature at the end of the Brayton cycle and push as much as you can into the temperature at the pump, at the exit of the pump, for a ranking cycle, it's not undoable. It takes time, it presumes fluency, and it presumes knowledge. The equations aren't difficult. Heat through heat exchanger, different change in H across the one fluid must equal change in H across the other fluid. It's not, um, the maths isn't hard, it's just about discipline and keeping things, um, sorry, bad answer to your question. I didn't answer your question, but I guess that's... So, it's a Brayton cycle on top, <coughs> and a Rankine cycle below, <coughs> and you analyse it um, in such a manner. Excellent. So, they are... So, my intention was, we did a four state points Brayton cycle, let's look at other Brayton cycles. So, we looked at regeneration, intercooling, reheating, in one section, modifying the Brayton cycle to make it more thermally efficient, that you can get, you know, from 40 to 70. That was kind of what I was talking about uh, in the ideal case. Then we looked at jet propulsion, which is like a Brayton cycle, but is different. We don't get electricity. We get change in momentum out of it. Um, and then I've just mentioned that another thing we can do with a Brayton cycle is use the waste heat to run a Rankine cycle. There's a similar long lecture on the Rankine cycle planned for next week where we'll talk about 
reheating, regenerating, um, some different things you can do with feed water to preheat it, uh, and so forth. And so that'll be, that's next week's fun and games. Um, that's all I got, any questions? Great, good, all right, I will see you tomorrow afternoon. Thanks guys. <laughs>